my name is John Paul, and um, I'm in the IQ team led by Stan. And uh, I'm going to talk about looking inside our immersive devices. So quick outline. Um, I'm going to start by talking about the current state of our devices and the understanding of how they operate. The main topic is I'm going to talk about physical characterization of these memristors. Um, in this case, I'm going to talk about using x-rays and TM to do the physical characterization. I'll describe the formation of conductive channels. Um, and as Stan promised yesterday, I'll try to shed some light on the material nature of these conductive channels. So then I'd like to conclude with um, the resulting picture that we get and how we can use this to make these devices. Okay, so here are our memristor devices. Um, these are the titanium dioxide uh, based devices. In fact, we, here's a number of publications uh, just recently that have, in the last uh, year or two that have been coming out using these kinds of devices. We've got very nice uh, bipolar resistance switching occurring, which is uh, initiated by an electrophonic set. Um, we see very nice device properties that have been demonstrated um, fast, dense, non volatile, large on off ratio. Um, in terms of a physical understanding for how these devices operate, there's uh, a number of uh, models that have been proposed to describe this. One of the leading candidates, as been, has been mentioned, involves oxygen vacancies. And nonetheless, I don't think I'm going out on a limb to say that solid evidence for what's going on has yet to be shown. I think some of the uh, animated discussion that we saw today is an illustration of that. So what I've been inspired to do is try to look inside these uh, memristors and try to understand what's going on. Um, so some of the challenges for physical characterization are we need a very nice spatial resolution. We expect conducting channels to be in the nanoscale. Um, we've got a number of uh, different materials in these devices, the electrode material, the switching material. So we want to be able to distinguish these uh, materials from each other. And not only, not only that, we want to know the uh, chemical state of the material. And then finally, if we want to do a non-destructive measurement, we're going to have to be able to look below uh, these uh, top electrodes. And so what I'm going to describe is doing this using x-rays and electrons, so just basically focus x-rays and focus electrons um, in here in these kind of devices. I think most of you are pretty familiar with electron-based techniques like TEM and SEM. So I'm going to spend one slide quickly going over uh, x-ray-based techniques. So what I'm basically doing is I've got my sample and I'm shining x-rays on it, and I'm monitoring the absorption um, of the x-rays by the sample. So what I'm going to be showing is uh, what's called the titanium L absorption edge. And so here's some, uh, here's some spectra that you can get from that. Now the basic excitation that we're doing is we're coming in with x-rays and we're exciting a, a core 2P level <coughs> to the 3D unfilled, unfilled valence level. And so here's a number of titanium absorption spectra for different chemistries. When we start with titanium metal. What you see here is two broad absorption peaks. And these two absorption peaks are called the L3 and the L2. And that actually just corresponds to the two different uh, core levels that you're excited from. Now, if we now put oxygen in the mix and we actually have this titanium atom surrounded by um, oxygen, you actually get a change in the unfilled uh, valence orbitals that are allowed. And so, for example, in this case, you see that these two broad peaks are actually splitting into four peaks, what's called the crystal field split. And all the way to titanium, a stoichiometric titanium dioxide, you see a very strong so you see these uh, four uh, crystal field split uh, peaks. And in fact, you can actually get structural information. Um, so this, for example, is actually the anatase phase of titanium dioxide. And that's uh, evident from this peak. peak you see this, uh, this ability in that peak. So the main message is that with X-ray approach and spectroscopy, you basically can get a fingerprint of what the chemistry and structure is of the device. And so with this technique, um, we're able to, just by turning the energy to the material that we want to study, we can actually isolate the material that we're interested in, and from that we can actually get the chemical and structural state of the material. Uh, to do um, microscopy, I use what's called a SIXO, a scanning transmission X-ray microscope, and the basic technique is we're coming in with X-rays that are focused by a zone plate, uh, just a diffraction-based uh, optics. This focuses down, the X-rays to a spot on the sample, um, this is a transmission geometry, so we measure um, the x-rays on the other side of the detector, and we take images just by raster scanning the sample around. And so for this particular uh, zone plate that was used, we got a spatial resolution of about 35 nanometers, maybe a, maybe a little bit better. So and this is a transmission technique, so we're probing the entire bulk of the sample. To prepare devices for these kinds of transmission measurements, both for 6 and and for TEM, um, I fabricated the devices on top of a 20 nanometer silicon nitride window. 
And so this is an illustration of the device with the bottom electrode, and we've got a blanket layer of oxide everywhere, and then a top electrode. And these are uh, defined to actually overlap right in this silicon nitride window where the uh, silicon is connected away. So here's now a top view of the device, um, the uh, top and bottom electrodes, um, and the junction right on the silicon nitride window. Okay, so here's actual some actual data. So these devices were fabricated the way I just described, and here's the electrical data that I saw. Very nice bipolar resistance switching. Um, very similar to the, the types of uh, data that we've been publishing on uh, devices that are not new on Windows. Um, so what I did was I cycled this device a number of times, uh, less than 10, and then went ahead and loaded it into the system. So what you're seeing here is actually an X-ray image of the device. Um, this is at an energy of 460 dB. You can see the uh, top electrode, bottom electrode right here, and here's the junction area. And already inside this junction, you actually see some contrast within it. Now, every single pixel that you have here, in fact, we have an entire spectra associated with it. So let me show you the spectra correlating to uh, different parameters in this device. So um, here's three different spectra. You can just already qualitatively see some dramatic differences. Um, for such a short talk, I won't go too much into spectroscopy, but we actually spend a lot of time in understanding and uh, driving this spectra, um, both from our own measurements and actual uh, looking the literature. And so what we start off with, here inside this, uh, this spectra in green, which is outside of the junction, this is actually the as grown titanium dioxide, which is an amorphous phase. Um, right here inside the junction, the spectra shown in red, this has actually been heated up and uh, gone into a polycrystalline the anode is This is well seen in the literature. We also did our own careful studies where we just warmed up the amorphous dioxide and saw the evolution into this uh, spectra. And so this is uh, within the junction we've got sufficient heating that we actually formed this extra space. So most interesting is this uh, spectra in blue, and you can see a very qualitative difference uh, to the other ones, namely this crystal field splitting that I described. Instead of four peaks, we're going back into this picture of more like two peaks. And in fact, I already prepared you for understanding the spectra in that initial slide. You can see that the spectra in blue is moving more in the direction of titanium metal. Um, instead of the four peaks, we're moving into this uh, oxygen ore um, regime. And another piece of evidence that we have is this low energy uh, absorption peak right here, about 456 EV. And that corresponds to a valence state of titanium plus three as opposed to the plus four that you have in titanium dioxide. So we basically conclude that we've got a region inside the device, a very localized region, where it's oxygen four and it's actually uh, suboxide of titanium dioxide. OK, I mentioned that we have an entire spectra associated with each pixel. So we can now go ahead and map out what's the chemistry at every point inside this junction. And that's what I've mapped out right here. Um, the regions in green are the amorphous phases of dioxide. In red is this heated up um, uh, anaphase phase of the dioxide, and you can see it's within the junction. In fact, it extends all along this bottom electrode. The bottom electrode was a little bit thinner than the top electrode, so we had some additional dual heating during the operation of the device. And then here in blue, we've got this reduced uh, region of the device. Okay, so the next step is to take this exact same device and look at it in Indiana and actually perform electron diffraction. Uh, doing that, you see in this region, this green region, we in fact confirm we've got an amorphous diffraction pattern. Inside the junction, we've got these nice polycrystalline diffraction rings. And a lot of these correspond actually to the platinum electrode itself, but a number, a number of them are actually unique to the anatase phase, and in particular the center one right here. Um, and then finally, this, uh, this reduced spot, we put in uh, the electron diffraction right in the center of it. What we got was, these, instead of rings, we got this very distinct uh, set of diffraction peaks corresponding to a single crystal diffraction patterns. We then proceeded to index these diffraction, um, these diffraction uh, spots. And what we saw was that we were able to identify this to be a single crystal of TI-407. And so you, can, you see here inside the data, these circles in blue and they are uh, from a simulation of the diffraction we get from TI-407. Uh, single crystal TFR, TI-407, and you can see this overlays very nicely with our data. Um, here's now a dark field image of this TI-407 crystallite. Um, this is uh, 
You can see it's a very small crystal, less than 100 nanometers. So it's, it's, it's smaller than this entire uh, reduced region that's right in the center, a very small crystal of TI-407. Um, a little bit about TI-407. Um, this is a, uh, a stable suboxide of TiO2. It's a uh, part of the family of phases called the Magnoli phases. Um, interesting for us, it's metal at room temperature. Um, a little bit about the structure, you basically think of it as rutile TiO2 with planes of oxygen vacancies. Um, more precisely, uh, you've got stacking fault planes that are crumbling like TiO3. And so essentially, like I said, planes of oxygen vacancies regularly arranged in this material. Now, I, I mentioned that we basically um, got this uh, image of this device as one that had been cycled a number of times. So the question is, when exactly did this uh, conductive channel form? So a very quick experiment. Um, this is now on another sample where I loaded up a virgin sample into the system. Here's now the IV virgin state and an image of it before any strong bias was applied. Next step was to actually electroform it and saw that this feature developed near the top of the junction. Um, zooming in and bringing out the titanium plus three component, we saw very small, about 125 nanometer channel inside there. Next step is to switch it on, and what we see is nothing changes, at least within the measurement uh, accuracy. We still have about 125 nanometer channel here. Um, so basically what we're seeing is that the, the subsequent on switching doesn't give any measurable change to this conductive channel that occurred in the electroformative step. Okay, so the resulting picture that we have we started off with a junction of amorphous titanium dioxide and switching material. In the electroforming step, we formed this conductive channel. We were able to identify both the stoichiometry and the structure of this conductive channel with the TFO 70 magnetic crystal. We saw that subsequent on switching doesn't change the area of the device, at least in the lateral dimension. So this is consistent with the picture that Stan described of uh, instead an on off switching being some kind of vertical modulation of a very small amount of this gap size. Um, so we've got nice direct evidence for the role of oxygen vacancies um, in the operation of these devices. And um, as a surprise, we saw that there was some actual long-range ordering in these vacancies. Now, one last thing I want to show is um, if we're seeing that the electroforming step is just creating this uh, suboxide channel, we can avoid the electroforming step by just throwing a layer that deliberately engineered from the beginning. And this is exactly what my colleague Jim Laudain did. He drew a very thick um, suboxide layer going from a TI-407 target and then a very thin high oxide from a rutile target. And here's the beautiful data that he got. No electroforming step. The off state is identical to the virgin state and it just goes right into this on-off switching. Um, so that, I'd like to conclude. We saw the power of X-ray spectrum microscopy. We saw localized heating and reduction. With TEM, we're able to identify exactly the stoichiometry and phase uh, structure of this uh, conductive region. We saw that it's formed in the electroforming step and then on switching using very minor material change. Um, so I'd like to thank my collaborators. <coughs> thank you for your time. So, what happens in an off state? So, as far as we can tell in the off state, um, as you can see in this device, for example, the off-state is identical to the virgin right. state. Well, so uh, in this case, yeah, there. yeah, so in this case, in the sample, when I went to switch it off, I actually broke the sample. The, the heating that was necessary broke it. So um, as far as we can tell, any kind of change in the off-state, um, so Stan mentioned that most of these devices break from the wires. Well, that's even more true when you build it on a membrane and you don't have a good heating reservoir to get rid of it. So this sample that I did show, here, this had already been cycled on and off many times, so it's not clear. <coughs> but as far as we can tell from the, um, the electrical data, this is a very small change in that conductive channel. It's just a change in the time of the So most of our information for the off state is actually coming from electrical data. Yes. Have you got any idea about the thin uh, high oxide layer on top of the metal? So we don't we don't know the exact thickness of it. Um, from, the, uh, from some electrical data from Julian Borghetti, he showed that both the, the in the on state, you actually, the conduction is actually a tunneling conduction. So basically, as opposed to an insulating conduction. So we've got a model that it's very, it's a very thin gap there. And so in my measurements, of course, this is a top view of the device. 
not from the side. So you actually see that gap. So you have to kind of go. have a very distinct diffraction pattern, so we're actually seeing uh, specifically TI-407. Um, but why this one in particular, I think, I think actually, as Stan had mentioned before, I think you can get a whole range of suboxides that are stable. It's a matter of your compliance. How strong can you form it? I mean, this occurred in the electroforming step. So. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, data seems to be exactly matched, so the best guess is that we've got the exact same uh, behavior occurring in the smaller devices. Of course, that really pushes the spatial resolution. Um, you can see that we've got you know, hundreds of nanometer channel here, so we scale that down to the smaller devices, and uh, it's a little bit tough to see. But uh, at least from the electrical behavior, the devices seem to be identical. So the conclusion is the physical properties are probably. Can you tell me what the orientation of TI-407 is? I mean, uh, if you think about those slabs, are they no, oriented correctly? No, actually, uh, that's that question I asked my colleague earlier this week. So from our simulation, we know that data. He said it would just take a few hours to figure out where these planes are oriented, but I was wondering the same thing. So I don't know that answer just yet. But <laughs> it'd be useful to know whether you've got the yeah, right. aligned as you'd that's expect right. to have. Is that a necessary or just you know an ancillary effect? Most likely, it's actually thermal, uh, it's thermally assisted electrochemistry and vacancy drift and thermal field. Yeah, you have a pretty high field to play across there. You can catch a really high field across mm -hmm. there. If you're talking about taking an enemy, you've got a number, you can talk about a few holes that are huge. And so the field uh, migration should be more than adequate than the temperature is All right, so for the electro, so distinguish the electroforming step. Forming this no, 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 no. Okay, you're talking about on-off switching. On -off. Right, right. So the on-off switching, as Stan mentioned, even in, as a normal device, when you're switching it on and off, we've got uh, massive current still running through the device and the wires are still breaking. And now we've got this all on a freestanding 20 nanometer membrane, so it's just heating up. Okay. Can I just add quickly a follow-up point? Even if you were able to discern that, I mean, even if you were able to do that as current, you wouldn't be able to differentiate on and off because of the projection. That, that, that one I want to know. Yeah, I mean, what if you could, that it isn't that, that you can't do it, maybe that. If there's no additional science, then you can't understand. First, the original question, uh, you mentioned that you hold the titanium oxide and the water is very good. The water is very good. And then, uh, some of the titanium oxide is very good. So this is outside of the junction, up here. So it's not been heated. No, no, so when I said I, I, I've taken uh, blanket layers and heated it to see how the spectra evolves from the amorphous to the unfaced phase. So the heating that occurred here was actually just in the operation of the device. So I didn't that way. Thank you. 